All right, we'll go ahead and record, but feel free to ask questions anytime. I'll also pause the recording to go over questions. So if you want to go ahead and, again, work through this problem as I'm working through it and get some work done here in this hour, I think that would be a great idea. So here we want to do uh, f of x is equal to 8x plus 4. And then we have g of x. g of x is equal to 2x. Okay, so part A says we want to find f of g of x. So part A says, and we'll just go through them, we want to find f of g. And normally the notation looks like this, f of g of x. Another way to write the notation is f of g of x. Okay, so either notation is perfectly fine. I prefer the second notation. No matter what, you're always going to do the innermost first. We have to know what g of x is first. Here's g of x. And we know what g of x is. g of x is 2x. So all we're going to do in the first step is just substitution. So we're going to replace g of x with 2x. So this is going to be f of 2x. All right. And what this means, we'll go ahead and write out the definition of f of 2x. This means in the function f, in F, everywhere that there's an X, what you're going to do is you're going to write 2X instead. What you're really doing here is you're substituting. So F of 2X, we're going to go to F. We see an 8, we're going to write an 8. So in the function, in F of X, we see an 8, we're going to write an 8. So it's going to be 8. And then we see an X. Instead of writing X, we're going to write 2X. And that's going to be plus 4 comes next. Plus 4. Now our job here is to just simplify. So here, 8 times 2X, that's going to be 16X. And then we have plus 4. And that's it. That's our answer. Okay. And what I'm going to do is... I'm going to jump to my math lab. I'm actually going to put that answer in. And then it's going to talk about the domain range next. Okay. So we'll give a minute here for notes. And then we're going to jump over to my math lab and actually enter those answers into my math lab so we can see how it's done. All right. We're going to jump over to my math lab in F of G of X. There we go. There's the notation that we were looking for also. And that is 16x plus 4. That'll be our answer. Let's check it. There we go. So now it's going to ask for the domain. All right. And the domain on this one, if you remember back to, um, if you remember back to, this was like chapter three. When finding domain. So when it says find the domain. There are two things that you had to worry about. Is X in a denominator? Okay. And so we can take them separately. If we look at F of X, is X in a denominator? No, X is only, I mean, the only thing you're doing with X is you're multiplying it by eight. There's no division by X. So that's great. There is no, there is no X in the denominator. The other thing is, is X, in a square root, right? And a square root looks like this. Is X in a square root? Well, no, no, not for F and not for X. So here we have no problems. There are no potential problems with the domain. So the domain for F, the domain for F is from negative infinity to infinity. And the domain for G is also negative infinity to infinity. And the domain of f of g of x is also going to be negative infinity to infinity. I mean, you can look at it here too. There's no division, no square roots. Our domain are all real numbers. All right. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and pause the recording here. All right. We're going to jump over to my math lab. And here, the domain is all real numbers. So this one, there are no problems because there is no division and there are no square roots. 
there are no problems. There are no problems. So we're going to check here. There we go. So now it wants f of g of x. So we're going to do this again. And the book, I don't know why the book does this, but the book switches its notation. It switches its notation. And again, I don't know why it does it, but it does it. Okay. So for now, it's using this g of, so in part b, it's using this g of f of x notation, okay? And that's a fine notation. I just think it's a little bit more intuitive if we do the f of g of x notation, okay? And we have to remember that f of x is 8x plus 4, and then g of x is 2x. All right, so what we're going to do here, this time you do the innermost first. But this time, the innermost function is f of x. Okay, and clearly I wrote it wrong. I wrote it wrong the second time. So we're going to get rid of that. Please, please, please go ahead and fix that. Because that is g. Oop, that should be g of f of x. g of f of x. So make sure we make that correction because the innermost is f of x. So when we write it, the innermost should be f of x. What we're going to do here is we're going to substitute. What is f of x equal to? f of x is equal to 8x plus 4. So we're just going to replace it. So this is going to be g of 8x plus 4. Okay. And we can write out what that means. That means in g, in g, everywhere you see x, or we could just say where you see x, where there's an X, we'll just keep it very basic. Where there's an X, write 8X plus 4. All right, keep it as basic as possible. So we go to G. Here's G. We see a 2, we're going to write a 2. We see an X, what we're going to write instead of X is 8X plus 4. So if you really think about composite functions more as substitution, because that's what it is, it is substitution, I think it really makes things come together a little bit more. Practice also really helps things come together, okay? All we need to do now is distribute 2 times 8x is 16x, 2 times uh, 4 is 8. So our answer is going to be 16x plus 8. So we're, let's jump over to my math lab and we're going to enter that 16x plus 8. And the domain is going to be all real numbers because there's no division, no square roots. So 16x plus 8. And then the domain is all real numbers. All right. So I had a really good idea. We're going to pause the recording here. All right, so we have f of f of x next. We actually switched it up. We switched our functions up here. So don't think we're working with the same functions before. This time our f of x is 9x plus 2, and our g of x is 6x. So f of f of x, that's going to be f of f of x. And this time we're going to replace, we're going to substitute f of x. Sorry, I think I jumped screens. We're going to replace f of x with, 9x plus 2. So that's going to be our first step. That's going to be 9. Oop, it's going to be f of 9x plus 2. So this is going to be f of 9x plus 2. And what this means is in f, so we go back to f, everywhere we see x, we write 9x plus 2. So the first thing we see is a 9. So we write a 9. And the second C is an X. So we write 9X. We write 9X plus 2. And then we still have the plus 2. So we still have to write plus 2. So we're going to distribute here. We have 9 times 9 is 81. So this is going to be 81X plus 
Nine times two is 18, and then it's plus two. Our answer here is gonna be 81X plus 20. That's what we're gonna write in for F of F of X. For the domain, the domain is gonna be all real numbers. So domain is gonna be all real numbers. All real numbers. Okay, and why is that? Because there's no division and there are no square roots. That's why there are, there's no issues with the domain. The domain is all real numbers. All right, we'll pause. All right, what we're gonna do next is part D and we just need G. So I'm gonna scroll down just a little bit here and we're gonna do part D. Part D says G of G, well, We'll write it just like the book does. It's G of G of X, which is equal to G of G of X. I prefer the second notation because then you work with the innermost, but either way, the innermost is going to be G of X. So we're going to replace G of X with what G of X is, 6X. So this is going to be G of 6X. What G of 6X means is in G, everywhere you see X, you write six. So the first thing we see is a six. So that's gonna be equal to six. And then we see an X, so we're gonna write six X. Six times six X is 36 X. So this will be the answer for G of G of X. And then it's gonna ask for the domain. The domain is gonna be all real numbers again. And the reason why it's all real numbers there is no division. There is no square root. So there are no problems. If you have no problems, all real numbers work. You can always multiply by 36, all real numbers. So it's two parts. The first part you put in the 36X, the second part you put in the domain. All right, we're gonna pause here before we go to the next question. All right. so. We are working now on homework 06A. 06A, this is number 28, number 28. All right, and here we're gonna go through the steps of finding the inverse. And um, we're gonna use the function f of x equals x cubed plus six. This is gonna be our function, okay? So the steps to finding the inverse. Steps to finding the inverse. First step, uh-oh. Step one is going to be change the f of x to just x, change f of x to x, and then change the x to y. Change f of x to x and change the x to a y. Or change all x's. Change all X's to Y. In this case, we only have one X, so that's what we're gonna change. So this F of X becomes X equals, and then X cubed becomes Y cubed plus six. All right, so that's our first step to, to finding the inverse. What we're really doing is swapping the X and Y values. That's all we're really doing. And then step two is you wanna solve for the Y right? Which means get Y by itself. Get Y by itself. So in order to get the Y by itself, right? We want the Y by itself. Well, it's got a cubed, but we take care of the plus six first. We're going to subtract six on both sides. This is going to give us X minus six equals Y cubed. And to get rid of the cubed, we're going to take the cubed root on both sides. We're going to take the cubed root on both sides. Then the cube and the cubed root cancel each other. We're left with y equals the cubed root of x minus six, okay? So what I'm going to do is just show you how to put that into my math lab, okay? So even though this isn't the same problem that I'm working out right now, I'll just show you how to put it in. So when you go to my math lab, because this can be a tricky part, you have to use this symbol right here. It's the symbol that if you hover it over, it says nth root. And then it's going to be a three on the top of the root. And then it's going to be an X minus six on the, is that right? 
that's probably wrong. Let me go back and look. What was our final answer? It was, oh, no, 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 that's right. We subtracted six, take the cube root. Yep, looks good. Okay, so that that is correct. This is how you would enter it in my math lab. Okay. Now, what we want to do next, these are a little bit out of order. My math lab does this a lot where they go out of order. The next thing they say is find the domain and range of f and negative x or of the function and their inverse, right? So that's the inverse function. So that's okay. We'll do part B next. So let's write them both out. Our function is f of x equals x cubed plus six. The inverse function is f to the negative one of x, which just means the inverse function is the cubed root of x minus six. To find domain, so find domain of f of x. Well, we go to f of x. Do we have any division? There's no division. And there's no square roots. If there's no division and no square roots, there's no problem. So the domain is going to be all real numbers. All real numbers. Okay. Now, the next part, what we're going to, sorry, it's looking up. There, what is going on? There we go. The next part, we want to find the domain of the inverse of x. So we look at the inverse. This time we're looking at the inverse. We want the domain of the inverse. But once again, there's no division. There's no division at all in the inverse. And there's no square root. Right? And what we should really say is there's no even root. Even roots cause problems with the domain. Odd roots have no problems at all. So there's the domain of the inverse is all real numbers. The domain of the inverse is all real numbers. Okay. Now, to find the range, to find the range of f of x, the range of f of x is equal to the domain of the inverse. So we know the domain of the inverse is all real numbers. So we'll color code it. That means our range is going to be all real numbers. Okay. And then when we find the range, the range of the inverse, the range of the inverse is the same as the domain of the function. So when you are finding domain and range of a function, so you're given a function, all you find is domain. You find the domain of the original function and you find the domain of the inverse. So here, I'll, and I'm trying to color code this, right? The domain is gonna be f of x here. It's all real numbers all real numbers. So when you're doing these, two are always going to be the same. The range of the inverse is always going to be the same as the domain of the original problem. And then the domain of the inverse is always going to be the same as the range of the original function. So you're really only doing two things. Now, when we enter that into my math lab, they have things all out of order for us, okay? But that's okay. I'm gonna get this problem wrong or should we just get it right? We could just put a plus three and I'll get it right. Let's get it right because it'll probably take less time to get it right than get it wrong. So we just need to put a plus three instead of a minus six. Plus three, there we go. Excellent. And it doesn't matter because the domain is all real numbers. So you just click all real numbers for each one. But they do ask you for the domain and range of f first, even though when you're calculating this, you will not find the range of f first. 
you will find the domain of the inverse first. But that's okay. All of them are the same on this one. Not so bad. Not so bad. All right. Then we're going to look at the graphs. And um, so let's look at the graphs. How would we graph this thing? First of all, we can't see anything, but that's fine. Let's go graph these functions. And graphing the functions actually isn't too bad, okay? Because you can graph using transformations. We know that x cubed, we know what x cubed looks like. It's from our library of functions. x cubed looks like this. And plus six moves it up six. So that means the total combination I'll do in purple, the whole thing is gonna go up six, one, two, three, four, five, six. And that's gonna be the inflection point. It'll look something like that, okay? It's not perfect, but we do know it goes through the point zero six. So when we go to my math lab and you're looking, except of course, mine's gonna go through the point zero negative three. When you're looking, we're looking for f of x to go through zero. Yeah, in blue. See how you can tell in blue, it shows the f of x in blue. That is going through the point zero six. That looks like the cube function. I'm going to select A for mine. If you're doing the one that we have up on the board here, make sure that you're, it goes through the point zero six because it was x cubed but it's shifted up six. All right, we're gonna pause here. All right, the next problem type, we are on homework 06A, and this is number 34. And what we need to know here is that the domain of the original function, right, which we call, we call that f of x, is equal to the range of the inverse which we call f to the negative one of x, f to the negative one of x. Oop, there should be a negative one up there. Okay, and the other thing we need to know is that the domain of the inverse, which is f to the negative one of x, is equal to the range of the original, which we call f of x. So on this problem, when it asks for the domain, when it asks for the domain of the inverse, that's the range of the original. So you're just going to put in seven comma infinity, and it's going to be a bracket and a parenthesis. Then it's going to ask for the range of the inverse. The range of the inverse is the domain of the original. So it's just going to be negative infinity to zero. And just make sure your brackets and parentheses are the same. Um, and that's it. That's all there is to number 34. It's, it's really not so bad. Steps. All right. So we're going to go through a bunch of steps. This is homework. 06B. 06B. And this is number 45. So there's quite a few steps here um, on this problem. It says A through F. So the first step is find the domain. Anytime you have a logarithm and it's asking for the domain, you have to set the stuff inside the logarithm. Set the stuff inside the log. Right? And the natural logarithm is a log. Set the stuff inside the log to be greater than zero. It cannot be equal to zero because the domain of a logarithm is from zero to infinity. That's why we we're doing this. So in our problem, we're just going to take x minus 2 is greater than 0. And then we're going to add 2 to both sides, add 2. We're going to get x is greater than 2. OK? And then we're going to pop over to my math lab, and we're going to see how they want us to enter that. The domain, and it says use interval notation. Ah, there we go. So this is not interval notation. To do interval notation, we put it on a number line. We put two, we are greater than two. So we're going to the right. And that's a parenthesis. All the way to the right is infinity. Our answer is going to be from two to infinity. From two to infinity. That's how we'll enter our answer. 
Now, you'll notice that my question is not the same one as the question that we're doing, but that's fine. I'll still show how to go through it, okay? Oh, and I'm looking at the wrong thing. So here we go. This should work. I think I set it up correctly. Ah, there we go. Yep. So my domain is actually going to be negative two to infinity. But the example that we did is correct. The example we did is correct. Uh, to go on to part B, we need to see what it says for part A. Choose the graph. All right, perfect. So let's go to graphing these logarithms. Okay. So, and we're going we're gonna to choose the natural log of X minus two. That's the one we're going to graph. So we need to know what natural logarithms look like. Natural logarithms always go through the point zero. Uh, sorry, that's one zero. They always go through the point one zero. And they have this shape. So we'll do the original in purple. That's fine. Except let me draw it a little bit better. This is what logarithms look like. Okay. Now our logarithm has a transformation. Our transformation is minus two. That's on the inside of the function. It's on the inside of the parentheses. So this is going to go to the right two. So instead of the point one comma zero, we're going to go to the right two and we're going to be at the point three comma zero. And then we draw our, right? And so our asymptote also gets moved. So if we want to draw our asymptote, our asymptote is no longer y equals zero. It's going to be y equals two because it moved to the right two, moved to the right two. So that's what our function will look like after transformations. Okay. So, and once again, the example that I'm doing here is not the same as what I'm inputting, but that's okay. The same ideas work. Ours is shifted to the left two. So I'm looking for the one that was shifted to the left two. Well, if you go to the left two from one zero, you're at negative one zero. So I'm looking for the graph that touches negative one zero. Well, this one's off because it touches to the right. It has to touch to the left. Oh, in fact, all the transformations, they're all shifting. One's up, one's down, one's left, one's right. So B is going to be my correct answer because it's the only one that was shifted to the left. Okay. There we go. So we're just using those transformations that we learned earlier. From the graph, determine the range and the asymptote. So we're going to do the range next here. From the graph, we're going to determine the range. Paint's being goofy. So here's our graph. What's our range? Well, how low does this graph go? Range is how low it goes. This graph goes as low as you want. It goes to negative infinity. How high does this go? It actually goes on forever. It looks like maybe it won't go on forever, but it does. It keeps going on forever and forever. So our range and everybody's range is the same because logarithms always have a range from negative infinity to infinity. So we're going to pop over to my math lab and enter the range as parenthesis, negative infinity, comma, infinity. All right. And now it's going to ask for the vertical asymptote. So let's pop over. And when you're doing these problems, your vertical, you're sorry. Yeah, 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 it's a vertical asymptote. Your vertical asymptote is always going to start at y equals zero. And then you apply the transformation to that. Well, it's going to go to the right two. So now if it's going to the right two, we're now going to be at y equals two. So Let's jump over to my math lab because sometimes it's confusing the way they ask you to put input your answer. Oh, and, and I'm using y equals. It, it needs to be x equals, right? A vertical one is x equals. A vertical one is x equals. So please, it's x equals two. X equals two. All right. And I cheated, right? Because it says in part A, it says there is one vertical asymptote and it's x equals two. The example that we did, it's x equals two. Since on mine, it's plus two, it's going to go to the left two. So I'm going to enter negative two for mine. So we're just going to write negative two. And then check. Excellent. Now we're going to find the inverse. So we're going to find the inverse. So let's jump over 
we have our function. I'm going to go ahead and oops, I'm going to go ahead and grab just our function and give us some more space. So oops, hold on. Let's paste that. Let's bring it back. There was our function. And let's go down and we're going to paste the function down here because now we're going to find the inverse. So, well, it, it looks a little messy, but it's okay. When we find the inverse, you always change your f of x to just x. And then you change your, everywhere you see x, you write y. So it's going to be y minus two. And then our job is to solve for y. Our job is to get y by itself. Now, every logarithm has a base. The natural logarithm has a base of e. So we want to replace the natural log. And we're not replacing it. It's still the same thing. We want to write the natural log as log base e of y minus 2. The reason why we do that is because we need to rewrite our logarithm as an exponential. So this is going to become e to the x power equals y minus 2. E to the x power equals y minus 2. So we are rewriting the logarithm as an exponential. Okay? And then what are we going to do? We're going to add 2 to both sides. Then the y is all by itself. So we get y equals e to the x plus 2. All right. Now, we're going to jump over to my math lab. Actually, let's pause here real quick and see if there's Zoom. We're going to go to my math lab and we're going to jump in and put that answer in. And once again, I'm not putting in the same answer because ours, my problem is x plus 2, x plus 2. So this is going to be e to the x power. And then instead of plus 2, mine's going to be minus 2. And that'll be the inverse. All right, there we go. Now the domain, the domain. This time, our domain exponentials, and they always think it's kind of funny. Like, why don't they have you graph it first and then ask for the domain? But here on the domain, when we're asked for the domain, right, there's no division. There's no division by X. Okay, great. What else? There's no square roots or even roots. Okay, that's great also. What's the next one? There is no logarithms. So those are the three things that cause problems with domain. Since we don't have anyone, any of those, it's all real numbers. You also could have done it with the domain of the inverse. The domain of the inverse is the range of the original. The range of the original is the domain of the inverse. You could have done that also, so when we jump over to my math lab, we found the range of the original function. It was negative infinity to infinity. So the domain of the inverse is the same. Part E and part C are asking the same question. The domain is negative infinity, oops, except we have to use the symbol negative infinity, comma, infinity. All right. Now, our range, our range is going to be the same as the domain, right? So it's going to be part A. Whatever you put for part A is what you're going to put for the range of the inverse, because the range of the inverse is the same as the domain of the original. So we're going to write negative two to infinity. Negative two comma infinity. All right, let's check. There we go. And now we want to know the graph of this thing. So when we're graphing this, we need to know what e to the x looks like. Just e to the x. So we're just worried about e to the x. That always goes through the point 0, 1, and always has a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. So this is just what e to the x looks like. So what's e to the x? plus two look like that's going to bring ours up to so we're going to go up to 
zero, three. And then our asymptote is going to go up to as well. So it'll look like this. It goes through the point zero, three. Okay. And so select the graph that moved up to. Well, what, what does my graph do? My graph moves down to. So we're looking at the one that looks down. B looks like it's below. That should be the answer. There it is right there. All right, we're going to go ahead. I'm going to, yeah, we're going to go ahead and pause here. All right, on 46, we have f of x equals one third log six x. The first question is domain. Since there is a logarithm, we set the logarithm, the stuff inside the logarithm. So six x has to be greater than zero. Divide both sides by six. X has to be greater than, well, zero divided by six is still zero. They want it in interval notation. So we're going to put it on number line. We're greater than zero. So our domain is going to be from zero to infinity. That's how we'll enter it right here. And even though my question is a little bit different than this one, it's still, the domain still going to be the same thing. Zero to infinity. Mine has a three X instead of a six X. It's not going to change very much until we get to the inverse. So it's going to be negative infinity. Oh, not negative. It's zero to infinity. And we'll check it. There we go. Now we're going to choose the graph. So here we want to know, well, what's the graph of this thing look like? So we have to know what the logarithm looks like. The logarithm always goes through the point one zero. And it always has a vertical asymptote at x equals zero. So the original graph, the, the graph of just log of x, this is what the graph of log x looks like. That's just log x. But we have a one third. This one third, it's a vertical compression. Vertical compression. All right, that one we're not so worried about. It's a vertical compression by three. So all your Y values are gonna be cut into thirds, okay? That's fine. That's hard to draw. What's this one do? And not only is it hard to draw, but it doesn't affect, right? Cause zero divided by three is still zero. It doesn't uh, impact our, the point that we know, which is one comma zero. This six, this six belongs with the X. This is actually a horizontal compression because X is always do the opposite. So horizontal compression by six. So that means our point one, our one zero gets moved to one six comma zero. So we know one six comma zero is on there. And again, this is really hard to draw. I don't think I'd be able to freehand this, but it should be enough information to go ahead and pick out the graph that we need, okay? So first of all, the, the first graph is, is totally off on, on mine. Uh, I'm lying, not the first graph. The first graph's fine. This looks pretty good. Honestly, the first graph's probably the answer. But let's look at the others. That's not what our logarithm looks like, right? That doesn't look like our logarithm that has some sort of reflection in it. This does look like a logarithm, but the way it's intersecting the axis, it's past the point one zero. So this can't be it. And then let's look at D. I mean, D is just a line. D is clearly not it. A is the only one that it could possibly be. There we go. At least on mine. At least on mine. So now from the graph, I like this, from the graph, determine the range. So on our graph, how low does our graph go? I mean, our graph goes as low as, as low as possible, right? So our graph goes to negative infinity to infinity. Because how high does it go? You may say, how do we know that it goes to infinity? And, well, because logarithms, the, the, don't, the range of logarithms is always negative infinity to infinity. I suppose that's one way. But it does keep going up. Even though it goes up slightly each time, it decreases in its speed that it's going up. It still always keeps going up. So let's check, there we go. And the vertical asymptote is still gonna be X equals zero. It's still X equals zero because there was no shifting to change that. It was just compression and stretching. Compression and stretching does not change 
your asymptote. All right, let's go ahead and find the inverse of this thing. So we have our original function. Our original is f of x equals log one third log six x. So what we're the first thing that we're going to do is switch f of x becomes x. So to find the inverse is going to be x equals one third log, and we're going to write base ten. If they give you a logarithm and there is no base, the base of that logarithm is 10. And that's going to be of 6y, of 6y. Now, we need to get the y by itself. We need the y by itself. We need the logarithm by itself first. So the logarithm is not by itself because we have this one third. To get rid of one third, you multiply both sides by three. So the one third is going to cancel with the three on the right side. On the left side, you're left with three X. So we get three X equals log base 10 of six Y. Now to get rid of the logarithm, you rewrite the logarithm. The base of the logarithm is the same as the base of the exponential. It's 10 raised to the three X power. You always go opposite of the equal sign. So if you're on the right side, you always go to the left side. If you're on the left side, you go to the right side. And then, so 10 to the three X power equals six Y. And now to get rid of the multiplication by six, you divide both sides by six. It might look a little bit better. Instead of dividing by six, you multiply by one sixth. So you could write this as one sixth times 10 to the three X power, that equals Y. That's your inverse function. That's your inverse function. All right, so let's enter that. And obviously mine is a little bit different, but it's the same, it's the same idea. Mine's gonna have a three everywhere. It's gonna be one, mine's gonna be one third. Mine's gonna be one third, 10 to the X power. But it can't be 10 to the x power. Hold on. 10 to the 3x power. There we go. 10 to the 3x power. There we go. That's our inverse function. All right. Excellent. Now we're going to find domain and range. So the domain of the inverse is the same as the range of the original function. Negative infinity to infinity. And then to get the range of the inverse, the range of the inverse is the same as the domain of the original. It's the same as part A. So it's gonna be zero to infinity. And then we want the graph of this thing. Once again, there's really only one option, right? There's only one option. What's going to happen is we have a, so 3x is a horizontal compression and the one third is a, is a vertical compression. They're both compressed. So we can't have the point C and B are the only ones that could be answers, but C, our, our, our point that we know, which is zero one has been compressed. So B is going to be the correct answer compared to C. C has no compression at all here. So it can't be C. It has to be B. B is going to be our correct answer there. There we go. All right. We're going to pause the recording. That's it for our lecture right now.